Good morning. It's so good to be together, whether you're online or here in the church. We are together as a body of Christ, coming together to worship Him who is faithful. As we gather this day, I have a few announcements for us. First of all, the Joy Group will meet again on July the 14th. Joy Group, July the 14th. Put that on your calendar. Also, please contact Beth Murphy so we are able to know that you're going to attend to the Joy Group meeting on the 14th. Pastor Ray will be away from the office through July the 10th. If you need any pastoral care or need anything, please contact the church office. We have new guest and prayer request cards here in the pews of the church. If you're visiting today with us here, take a moment to fill out the card and place it on the offering plate as you leave the sanctuary. And of course, we want to be very uh, welcoming to our new folks here. If you are visiting with us, we have a blue guest bag that you can pick up in the Welcome Center or in the Narthex after the service so you can get to know us better and we'd like to get to know you better. I have a very special announcement that I really want you to take note of. At the request of the Pastor Nominating Committee, the session has called a congregational meeting to convene on July the 18th following the 10 o'clock service for the purpose of hearing and acting on the report of the PNC to elect a co-pastor to serve alongside our current pastor until his retirement, at which time the newly elected co-pastor will become pastor of Triangle Grace Church. Included in the motion to approve the candidate's election as pastor will be a recommendation that has been approved by the candidate the session, and the presbytery concerning the salary and benefits package. So once again, we will have a congregational meeting July the 18th after this 10 o'clock service. July the 18th, congregational meeting at 10, after the 10 o'clock service. Also, I'd like to um, share with you a prayer request this morning. Last night, a charter member of our church went home to be with the Lord, Leona Goss, has entered the church triumphant. Let us pray for Nikki and her sisters, Debbie and Karen, and the rest of the family. While we grieve, we may rejoice that Leona is healed and has victory in Jesus. As we worship this morning, let us hear the good news of the victory that we all share. Let us look at Psalm 95 for our call to worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the Lord, the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and great king above all gods. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, Indeed, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the head of the church. We thank you, Lord, for gathering us together this day. So, Lord, we approach your throne with confidence, with boldness, because we know you sit on the throne reigning. Lord, we know that you are here with us. You are our good, faithful shepherd. We thank you, Lord, for this time to worship you, to adore you, to proclaim the truth of your goodness, your power, your might, and your grace. We worship you alone. We come together, Lord, as your church, and we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you're able, let us sing together. If you're able, please stand. Sing, Here I Am, Lord.
Let us say what we believe with the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into the... The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. As we gather this day to worship our Lord, it is right for us, it is important for us to come humbly, to confess our sins before him. Let us do that together with the prayer of confession, which is in your bulletin. Lord, we thank you that you are gracious and compassionate God. Forgive us for the ways we have not reflected your abundant love to those around us. Help us to see more of you this week. Bless and strengthen us that we might be your witnesses in, in a world that needs to experience your love and justice. It is in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news from Scripture. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our inequities. For as high as the mountains are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. It is through Jesus Christ, our Savior, we are forgiven. With great joy, we'd like to the, invite the children to come forward for the children's sermon. Good morning. 
morning. <laughs> We're getting there. Great. <laughs> Do any of you have a favorite character from the Bible? No? No favorites? What's, who's your favorite? Jesus, that is a very good answer. Very good answer. I, we're going to talk a little bit this morning about one of my favorite biblical characters. Do you know who Samuel is? Yes. Do you know anything about Samuel? What do you know about Samuel? He's a person and he's called like three times. That's right. That's right. Do you want to preach the sermon? <laughs> you did great. That's right. He could. Samuel is called in the middle of the night by God, right? And he keeps thinking that it's a person who's calling him, but it's not, right? It's God. And you know what is really interesting to me about Samuel? Is he was a little boy when God called him. God didn't wait until he was an adult, until he was finished with college. God called him when he was young. <laughs> and when... God could use him as a little boy, right? So we don't have to be a certain age for God to use us. <laughs> Samuel also had a mother who loved him very much. <laughs> so why don't I pray for us this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these wonderful children that you love even so much more than we do. We thank you for the fact that your call is not limited to those of us who are adults, or those of us with fancy degrees or titles or gifts, but you call all of us. Help us to learn from those like Samuel who you called in very particular ways, but help us to be open to the things that you might be calling us to, whatever age we are, wherever we are in life. We thank you so much for these wonderful children, and we ask that you would bless their time together as you bless ours. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, you all have a good time with Miss Nancy. We all feel that way sometimes, don't we? <laughs> Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Son, and Spirit, we come before you this morning so grateful for your glory. We are so undeserving of the grace that you bestow on us morning after morning, week after week. We lift up to you all of our concerns this morning, knowing that you hear us and love us beyond what we can understand. Renew your peace within us that we might find our rest in you, despite the stresses that we have from day to day. We pray for those who are sick or struggling with mental, emotional, or physical distress. In particular, we lift up to, those, to you those who are struggling during the pandemic whether through illness, loss, fear, financial difficulties, or isolation. Lord, you know our needs. Help us to have eyes to see each other's and look for ways to answer your call to love one another as you have loved us. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, especially those who have experienced losses in the tragic building collapse in Florida. We pray for the survivors and those who are seeking to rebuild their lives. We pray for our nation this morning. We ask you to help us be those who would heal the divides between us. We pray for our leaders locally and nationally. Give them insight into the problems and injustices that our communities face and creativity about solutions that do not neglect those whose voices are not as readily heard. We pray for unity within the church, that we might anticipate each other's needs and serve one another faithfully. In this new season of our life together, we thank you for what you are doing and will do among us. 
Give us wisdom for next steps as we seek to do your will in this time and place. Lord, guide us with your truth and your love. We lift all these prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's special music is America the Beautiful. Good morning. Happy Independence Day. Um, this is a song that I believe should not be sung by just one voice. And so we all know the first verse, uh, but the second, third, and fourth verses are a little fuzzy. So there's, that was why the lyric sheets were in the back. Please sing along with America the Beautiful. of grain for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain America America God shed his grace on Success be nobleness and every gain divine. Oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years. Thine alabaster cities gleam. on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Thank you so much, Robert, and 
the choir. <laughs> I have a confession to make to all of you. Uh, growing up, I was com completely, sorry, I'm still getting used to the technology. <laughs> I was completely immersed in scripture. I often say that because my parents became Christians not long before they met, married, and had my brother and I, that they raised us with the zeal of the converted. Because I was basically raised within the walls of my church in New Jersey, if you had given me a pop quiz about the different parts of scripture on their own, I likely would have done fairly well. At least that would have been the case if you'd gone a little bit easy on some parts of the Old Testament like Leviticus or the Minor Prophets. But I struggled sometimes with bridging the different stories. I always felt like I had to pretend that I understood how the Bible fit together a lot better than I actually did. It wasn't actually until I started seminary that I really got a sense of some of the greater movements within the Old Testament in particular, and how all of scripture fits together as a whole. The more I understood of the story of Israel and how it led into the story of the church in the New Testament, the deeper I felt my understanding of everything, including Jesus himself, went. So now I try to always have the whole at least faintly in mind as I look at the details. So if you're like I was, you can breathe a sigh of relief. You are not alone. And we're gonna do a little bit of that this morning. If you were with us in worship last week, either virtually or in person, you know that we focused on Moses and the burning bush. We paid particular attention to Moses' answer to God especially in his initial response. The Hebrew word hineni, that means here I am. It indicates a special kind of readiness to what God might be calling someone to. Our story today comes around 400 years after Moses. The people of Israel have wandered in the desert, they've crossed the Jordan River, and they've settled in the promised land that God had promised to their ancestors but not everything has gone so smoothly. Once in the land, the people don't have a centralized government. Instead, they are a loose confederation of uh, a tribe, occasionally led by a series of leaders called judges. If you've ever read the book of Judges, you know that it is quite the ride. And it has a recurring phrase. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every person did what was right in their own eyes. Again and again in Judges, the people fall away from God, experience suffering as a result, and cry out to God for rescue. The Judges often play a crucial role in the way that God answers these prayers. Now, some Judges are more familiar to us than others. Gideon very memorably uses only 300 men to defeat a much larger force of Israel's enemies. Deborah is the only female judge and offers prophecies to the people. And most famous of all, of course, is Samson, a man of extraordinary physical strength and an extraordinary weakness for non-Israelite women. The last of the judges is Samuel, the subject of today's sermon. Samuel will go on to become a judge and a prophet, offering the word of God to all of Israel. He'll also literally be a kingmaker, anointing first Saul and then David to be Israel's first two kings. The anointing of the kings ushers in a whole new era, the monarchy, one that will span most of the rest of the Old Testament. Next week, we'll look at Isaiah, one of the major prophets who lived toward the end of this period. But for now, we turn to 1 Samuel. For a book that will recount the stories of such a new and important part of Israel's life and that will introduce us to the house of David, a line from which Jesus comes, it begins unexpectedly. The stories of these great and powerful men will come with time, but we begin somewhere small and otherwise unseen, with the private pain of a woman who longs, above everything, to have a child. This woman is named Hannah. The first chapter of 1 Samuel tells us that although she has a loving husband, she suffers greatly from her struggles with infertility. 
not only because she wants a child of her own and can't have one, but because her husband has a second wife who regularly torments Hannah about her childlessness. Feeling anguish about her situation, Hannah goes to the Lord's house to pray. Now in those days, of course, they did not have churches, and the temple in Jerusalem had not yet been built. Worship happened at what was known as the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. It was a portable structure that had been made during the time of Moses, back in the book of Exodus. During the time of Judges, the tabernacle was located in a town called Shiloh, which made it Israel's central location for worship. This is where all the action in the first few chapters of 1 Samuel takes place. So Hannah goes to the place where God is known to dwell to plead for her heart's desire, a child of her own. There she prays, vowing to God that she will give whatever child God gives her back to God. And there she's met and approached by Eli, another central figure in our story. Eli is the main priest at Shiloh. Priests serve the people in the tabernacle, accepting their sacrifices of meat and grain and offering them to God on the people's behalf. One detail that's helpful to know here is that while we as modern people frequently read or pray silently, that was not done in the ancient world. People read and they prayed aloud, not in their heads. So Eli, see, the priest, sees this woman who seems to be muttering to herself. He misinterprets what she's doing. She's pouring her heart out to God in her deepest pain, and he rebukes her, thinking that she's drunk. This is one of a series of misjudgments that Eli makes. When he acts, interacts with Samuel in the text we read for today, he's actually gone blind. But we can see from his reaction to Hannah that even before his eyes lose their physical sight, he's figuratively blind, unable to see this expression of deep faith standing before him. This mishandling of things is even more serious in the case of Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Now, I know those names are irresistibly beautiful, but don't rush to add them to your list of favorite baby names too quickly. Because Hophni and Phinehas, although they serve as priests in God's house, are given one of the harshest labels that the Bible has. Different translations put it differently. They're scoundrels, they're corrupt, evil men, base men, good-for-nothings, worthless men. They go through their duties of serving God, but do so with corruption, taking the best parts of the sacrifices the people would bring for themselves. They put themselves ahead of the people of God and even ahead of God himself. Their actions are detailed in the second chapter of 1 Samuel, where an unnamed prophet warns Eli that because he has not reigned in his son's sins, Eli's house will be destroyed. Hophni and Phinehas will die the same day, and a different house within the tribe of Levi will become a more faithful and God-honoring house of priests. Now, after her interaction with Eli, God hears Hannah's prayers and answers her with the gift of a son, Samuel. His name is a memorial to God's faithfulness in this moment. It means God hears. Hannah follows through with her vow and gives baby Samuel to Eli to raise, to serve God in the tabernacle. But we know what kind of environment of corruption the young Samuel is raised in, and this is where our scripture for today begins. If you have your Bible, please read along with me from 1 Samuel 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. 
And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, if you heard last week's sermon, I hope your ears were tingling when you heard that repeated line within this very rhythmic passage. Again and again, God calls Samuel, and Samuel answers with the word we're focusing on these weeks. Like Moses, who God calls from the midst of the burning bush, the boy Samuel answers, Hineni, here I am. Of course, you might have noticed something different about the way that Samuel answers. Samuel gives this answer both to God, as Moses did, but also to Eli, the priest. This difference will be important for us in the way we see this passage. This one is both about how we respond to God and how we respond to each other. While Moses' interaction with God was fairly straightforward, if it was hugely mysterious, there's something almost comical about this scene with little Samuel. We have a young boy who's lived his entire life in the service of God, running back and forth across the space of the tent of meeting, again and again mistaking the voice of the creator of the universe for his mentor. This happens three times before Eli realizes that the word of the Lord is coming to his little helper. What does it mean, though, when the scripture says that the word of God was rare in those days and that there was no frequent vision? Despite there being a place where God lived among the people of Israel, the tabernacle itself, God has not been speaking to the people in the way that God once did. The people are led by a spiritually and physically blind priest and his corrupt children. They, like their predecessors and judges, have been again falling into those patterns of doing what is right in their own eyes. But the narrator tells us one important detail. The lamp of God has not yet gone out. There is still hope that God will intervene, no matter how dire things get among the people and their leaders. And into this night, 
God speaks to a child. So how are we to interpret this? Last week, I told you about one of my favorite things about the Bible, about how honest it is about who and how we are, and how, and how in light of that, it testifies to God's faithfulness to us in spite of our human unfaithfulness. This week's story is another example of exactly that. Eli is the head of a corrupt family that he won't or can't take control of. Samuel, while well-intentioned, doesn't seem to know what he's doing and even tries to avoid the responsibility of a prophet by not telling Eli what God had said about his family. But God is still at work. And this chapter is also an example of another thing I love about scripture. This story, like so much of the Bible, is dynamic. It's rarely as simplistic as we tend to think of it. It's not like the Book of Virtues or an old morality play where there's one simple moral at the end for us to take away. Many of its characters are very dynamic and its lessons are challenging. In this story, for example, the Bible is not anti or pro-tradition in and of itself. It's not politically right or left in the way that we understand it. It's not fully conservative or progressive. Often scripture provides a third way, something that's a little more complicated than the simple answers and categories that we sometimes gravitate toward. Life is complicated, full of joys and sorrows, and so is our inspired word of God. It invites us in at no matter our level of spiritual or life maturity. Through the Spirit, it builds and grows and invites us in as we're ready to receive it. What does this all mean as it relates to Samuel and Eli? Like many of you, I learned this story as a child. Then I was inspired, as we all should be, by Hannah's open-heartedness to God, the way she lays out her soul before her maker. I was moved by the way she follows through on her promises to God and dedicates the thing she wanted most in the whole world, a son, to God, without any hesitation. And I was touched by this beloved son's eagerness to answer the call. Just as Samuel responds to God, I learned, so should we. And that interpretation is absolutely right. We too might experience some confusion about the call, trying to discern whether it's coming from God, whether it's coming from ourselves, whether it's coming from other people. And we too should answer God, speak, here I am, your servant hears. There's nothing wrong with reading the story this way. But as I've grown older, I've seen that most of the ways God speaks to us aren't clear calls like the one Samuel received in the night. I've come to understand the story on a different level, one that illustrates the beauty of God's ability to break down our categories and call us into something deeper. For example, I've heard this story interpreted as being about personal versus ritual religion. And you can see why people would interpret it that way. Samuel and his mother seem to represent this personal religion, where one can speak directly to God without a mediator, without the need of the sanctuary and the tabernacle. Hannah reaches directly to God and responds in extreme gratitude from the overflowing of her heart. Samuel, likewise, is open and available to God, and the relationship between them animates much of Israel's life in the years to come. Eli and his sons, on the other hand, represent institutionalized religion and every negative stereotype that can invoke. They are the people in charge of all the rituals that are meant to direct people to God, but they use their position of influence and power to enrich themselves and abuse the congregation. They are blind to what's happening around them, including the needs of the genuinely faithful, like Hannah. But the story isn't quite this black and white. Samuel, we're told, doesn't yet know the Lord. As I said, the story is almost comical in how he continues to run back and forth, not recognizing that it's not Eli, but God calling him. In fact, he only learns how to respond to God because of Eli's insight. 
Despite his physical and spiritual blindness, Eli is the one who gives Samuel the tools to answer God properly. He is the one who tells Samuel to lay down again, to make himself available for God with a posture of readiness, but not presumption, telling him that he should be ready if God should call him again. Eli's preparation instructs Samuel to be humble and gives him the words to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. The once rare word of God returns in strength to Shiloh and to all of Israel through this prophet. God speaks in the story, not in the expected venue and workings of the tent of meeting. Eli and his sons can do all of their rituals, but God is not a magic trick. God speaks on God's own terms, not to the priests during a prescribed sacrifice that's been abused, but to a child. This renewed spiritual dynamism is informed and shaped by the ritual represented by Eli. The tabernacle is not rejected, but continues on as a place where God can be met in spite of the corruption of the people who do the work there. In this way, the chapter shows us a complicated tapestry of how God works with and through deeply flawed and sinful people. While there's so much going on in this story for us to learn from, I want us to have two takeaways this morning. The first is something that you probably don't need to be told. As wonderful as the church is and can be, it, whether in its members or in its leadership, is capable of doing great damage to the faithful. This was true back in the days of the priests. Eli looks at Hannah's pain and judges her without taking time to understand who she is and where her heart is. Her son, or his sons take gifts that the people bring to honor God for themselves, threatening violence and abusing the resources of God's children to make themselves richer. I wonder if any of you have been deeply hurt by the church or by other Christians. While I hope that's not the case, I know that it has to be, at least for many of us. Sometimes that pain can hurt more because it's coming from people who should know better and who do know better. Maybe that hurt has even been inflicted here in a church as wonderful and kind as Triangle Grace. I can only speak for myself, but having grown up in the church, I too have been deeply hurt by it at times. I felt misunderstood, rejected, unappreciated at different moments. And I know others have experienced these same things and much worse. Where that pain exists, we should follow the example of Hannah and a young, another young man that Samuel will one day anoint as a king of Israel, David to whom is credited many of the Psalms, including some of the most emotional and wrenching ones. We don't have to pretend that we have things all together with God. We don't have to act as if our hurt or embarrassment or longing don't exist. There is an almost embarrassment, embarrassing honesty about Hannah's prayer and about so many of David's throughout the Psalms. But they don't just vent their feelings, as helpful as that can be at times. They don't dwell in their hurt. They pray their hurt. They pour their hearts out before God, acknowledging their hurt and suffering and praying for God to deliver justice. We are called to do that in the church as well, praying for ourselves and others. But more than that, too, where wrong has been done, that pain should be acknowledged and repented of, and reconciliation should be sought where it is possible and healthy to do so. But, as this story tells us, even in the midst of those places of pain and hurt, the lamp of God has not yet gone out. It has not gone out, and it never will because we have a blessed assurance in Jesus Christ that Eli and Samuel could never have dreamed of. Jesus told his disciple, Peter, that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Jesus Christ is the light of God, the light of the world, stronger than any lamp that existed in the tabernacle. This light shines in the darkness, including the darkness that we can inflict upon each other. And the darkness has not and will not overcome it. 
things around us in the church and outside of it can seem and can be very dire. But that's not the end of the story. The man who led my mother to Christ once told her a very hard truth. Being a Christian would be a lot easier were it not for other Christians. But living among, being wounded by, and forgiving other Christians is one of the main ways God teaches us to love others with the unconditional forgiving love that God extends to us. This brings us to my second takeaway. Like Moses and like Samuel, we might be those who are called to bring the word of God to people who haven't heard it in a long time, who need to hear it afresh in this moment in their lives, or who maybe haven't heard it at all. We might be those who are called to be wounded healers, who have experienced the difficulties of living and worshiping alongside others, who are just as broken and in need of grace as we are and who bring the light of Christ to those who need to see it. Let us be prepared to hear God calling us in unpredictable ways. His word might seem to come through your interests or your imagination. It might come through the needs of those around you, including the needs of your church. It might come through friends or family who recognize your gifts and suggest ways that you might use them. Again, I am here to help to get to know you and listen with you for God's word to you. And I hope to teach and maybe preach on this more in the months to come, continuing next week with Isaiah the prophet. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the word that you have given us this morning. We thank you for how you inspire the writers of scripture in ways that do not sugarcoat the magnitude and the effects that sin has on our lives, on our communities, and on our churches. But we thank you for the ways you correct us and redeem our shortcomings and the ways you continue to use the church as your witness in this age. We are a community of people who want to grow in our witness to you as we live alongside each other in the power of the Spirit. Teach us what we need to know to be responsive to your calls on our lives. Here we are, Lord. Speak, for your servants are listening. Amen. Earlier in our church service, we had a prayer of confession. And then we looked at Scripture saying to us, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Jesus gives us the gift of the table where we may partake of the bread and the cup. We come humbly to this table, not deserving, but from grace. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, We thank you for this time to approach you. Lord, help us to be still and know that you are God. You are the God of the bread and the cup and the table, the God of forgiveness. We give you thanks. Amen. In your bulletin, you will see the hymn of preparation, 383, Open Your Eyes, Lord. the words of institution given to us by Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this cup and eat this bread, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Lord, again, we give you thanks for your great love, for your forgiveness, for your faithfulness, for your sovereignty over sin. Help us to rejoice and to know that in you we are forgiven. Amen. As the disciples sat around the table with Jesus, after supper, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying to his disciples, Take, eat, do so in remembrance of me. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Take and eat. Thanks be to God. Then Jesus took a cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you as a new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Take, drink, do so in remembrance of me. Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you that you are Emmanuel with us. That you came to this earth, that you walked among us, teaching us, healing us, and saying that you were going ahead to Jerusalem, and you did. You said you would die on the cross, but you would rise again, and you did what you said you would do. We thank you, Lord. We celebrate, Lord. The good news, the gospel is, as you did rise, we rise also, those of us who believe in you. We thank you, Lord, that you are our rescuer. You are our savior, king of kings and Lord of lords. It is in your name, Jesus, that we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. If you're able, I'd like to invite you to please stand, singing the hymn of response, Number 342, Just As I Am.
we might live this week if we began every morning with the chorus of the song we sang earlier. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.